Okay, b- b- before we start, I just want to just clarify something with, with, with you all. So, w- when, we, when we spoke about this last week, this 3-1 combination, and we said here, there was a change in dispensation... And this is the one, two, three, and we're going to call this the fourth. I say fourth because it's not a scriptural term, it's not an inspired term, but we say the fourth, or three, one. And I put the change of dispensation here. That's what we spoke about last week. But what I've added on today, what I've added on, is that this is a type of this. And if it's a type, And we know it's a type because this said fallen and this said fallen in Revelation 14 and 18. So you can see the two. And if this is a a two, you can't have a two without a one. And you can't have a one and two without a three. So has everybody seen seen how we developed this one, two, three from this three, one combination? Yeah? So somebody was then asking that this change of dispensation, where, am, where, where, where does it occur in this time period, in this history? Where does it occur? And what I want us to understand is, when I just draw this change of dispensation, and I've said that this is from the dead, and it goes to the living, what, what I've been doing to date is very simple and basic diagrams. Okay, these are very basic, simple diagrams. Um, they get somewhat more complex and involved as we, as we want to move on. So I've deliberately kept things rather vague and not overly precise, because if you make them precise, you have to explain a lot of information. And because many of us here uh, are new to this message, I've kept it simple. So I want to explain that when I say here is a change of dispensation, I'm not marking it exactly at this point. What I'm saying is between this one and this one, there is a change of dispensation. Because someone was asking me that doesn't actually the change of dispensation occur here, at this point here? And the answer is yes, it does. It occurs here. This is the point that marks the change of dispensation. But when we, when we looked at it uh, on the cursory level, as we're doing now, I'm just trying to identify that you have a three-step testing process, then you have a new generation that comes up, a three and a one. And this one is typified by this three, so you have a one, two, three. And in between them is a change of dispensation. That's all I was trying to identify by putting this change of dispensation in this, in this, in this fashion that I've done it. As we move on in our studies, as we move on in our studies, we're going to lay this out a lot more carefully, and we're going to show where this dispensate, where this change happens, uh, and exactly what these events are. So, for those who didn't ask that question, hopefully that 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 makes sense. But for those who asked or pointed that issue out. I hope it, it, it explains why I've just done it that way. I'm not trying to say that the change of dispensation happens at an event here. I'm just trying to show that it separates these two and we don't have this continuum. It's this history, then this history. That's what I was trying to show. So 
So let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness. As we go on to a related subject, Father, but slightly different, we ask for grace and wisdom and understanding. Please help us to breathe in the Spirit of God so that we might know your will and have confidence to stand upon it. Be with us and bless us, Father. We ask and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> just before we begin, it's just like an anecdotal story. In, in our fellowship that we have uh, back home, uh, we have prayer meeting every week, and we're going through Steps to Christ. And I know that... that um, one of the sisters here and some who might be listening uh, on the video have, have been and, and, and sort of had an exp- a taste of, of, of what it's like in our fellowship group. And in our prayer meeting, we've got to, we, we, we got to a stage um, in chapter five um, where it talks about how you understand your experience, how you understand your experience. And it was talking about a class of people who are in this condition of sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent. And have you heard, the, have, do you remember the phrase reading it where it says, your promises are like ropes of sand? You heard, do you remember that phrase that Ellen White said? Ellen White says, you make these promises, but they're like ropes of sand. So you can see the imagery there. There's this sand that's pouring down. It looks like a rope that you could grasp hold of. But as soon as you do, it just crumbles because it's not a real rope it just looks like one so she says your promises are like ropes of sand you can't grab them together you can't hold them because they just disintegrate every time you do something with it and then she says what you need to understand is the true force of the will and she moves on in her in in her analysis of the situation but the point i want us to understand is that we have a bad experience. And the question is, why are we having a bad experience? Why is, why is your Christianity all going wrong? Why is it not working? Why when you make a resolve, you don't stick through with it? You're not going to eat this food, but you do. You're not going to shout, but you do. You've got a bad experience, an up and down experience. And she says, the reason that you have this experience is because you don't understand something. You don't understand something. And what you don't understand is the nature of man. If you don't understand the nature of man, you don't understand the nature of God. Why do we say that? It's because man was created in what? In God's image. So whatever you see a human being to be like, you see God to be like that. So, if you've got some lust, where did you get that from? Where did you get lust from? I'm going to suggest you got it from God. Because fallen Adam gave you nothing. Fallen Adam got nothing. Because lust is a part of the nature of man. It's part of the nature. It's part of what you are. Why are you so jealous for? Why do you have jealousy? Where did you get that from? You got it from God. Because the thing that defines God is that he's a jealous God. Do you know the word jealous and zealous are the same word? You know when it says about Jesus, the zeal of my house, the zeal of thy house has eaten me up? It's because he's jealous. He's jealous of what they're doing to his house. So when someone comes to your house and starts wrecking it, and you start getting angry about that, because you see what they're doing to your home, that wasn't something that Satan gave you, that thoughts, those experiences, those feelings, those emotions. That's an inbuilt emotion that a natural person who's created in the image of God has. 
for sure we've, we've, we've abused and manipulated those things. Well, I'm not arguing that, of the rights and wrongs, of what, where lust takes you now. But the fact that you have lust, that you have passion and desire, is a God-given attribute. We need to understand the nature of man. And then she says this, she says, what you need to understand... I'll put it in bracket because she doesn't say this bit. She doesn't quite say it like this, but she does do it. To fix the problem... And what's the problem? You've got bad experience. You're sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting. What you need to understand is one thing. If you understood this one thing, everything would be fine. You need to understand the true force of the will. When you understand the true force of the will, when you understand what the will is, when you have an understanding of what a human being is, intellectually, then you can start dealing with the problem. Until you understand what the true force of the will is, you are never going to sort this experience out. And so what happens is, if we were going to do a study on it, I'd say everybody turn to page 47.1, that's not the exact page, and I say, let's all read this together. And I said, let's have a vote now. Does everybody understand what those words mean? Does everybody understand what understand means? And we get a dictionary out. Does everybody understand what force means, what true means, and what the will is? We'd all say yes. So if we all say yes, I agree, what should happen after that Bible study? You fix the problem. Fix the problem. What? You will stop doing sin. You will stop doing sin. So the question is, I presume most of you have read Steps to Christ from cover to cover. If you have, you've read this before. Even though you might not remember it, you've read it before. So the, reason, the question is, why are you still sinning? The reason you're still sinning is because you... I'm going to suggest you do understand, or, or you didn't read it properly. But if you read it properly, I'm saying, what's there hard to understand now? Everybody in this room understands this now. I haven't, I, well, I haven't read the passage, I'm paraphrasing. But if it's true, and it is, this paraphrase, then the reason you, you, you keep on sinning this afternoon, this evening, is because you don't believe what's being written. You don't believe. You keep on going back to your old experience. You keep on making excuses. There's some way around you're going to get around this problem. Because if you understood how much force, how much power there is in this thing, you'd know that you can stop sinning. But because you don't understand it, I'm going to say that you do understand it now, because we could go through the dictionary and, and go through that. You don't actually believe it. You don't actually believe what's written. This is what we, un we need to understand about the true power of the word of God. The power of the word, the way the power works is that when you read it, you believe it. And your whole life changes around that. Your whole life changes around that. And then things start happening. And this is the struggle that's going on about the third angel's message. The third angel's message. There's a lack of understanding. And when you overcome the lack of understanding, there's a lack of belief. Because we don't understand as God's people the role of Islam. So all you need is someone to stand up before you and say, go to Revelation 7 verse 1. Go to Ezekiel 37 verse 9. And look, it says four winds and four winds. We'll go to some other places. And I'll show you what four winds is. I'm saying, now what are you going to do? And almost everybody to a man is going to say, I don't believe you. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm asking you that when you line up scripture, the theory turns into fact. Not my fact, not your fact, not your interpretation, but the fact. And people turn around and say, I'd rather rebel. But we don't like using rebellion as a word. We don't like re the word rebellion. We like to use the word, I don't understand. 
It's difficult. You don't understand my situation. God doesn't understand my situation. God doesn't realize how difficult it is to be a mother or a father or whatever it is. No one seems to understand anything because you don't seem to understand. I don't seem to understand. God doesn't. No one understands anything, apparently. But the reality is we're living in rebellion and we don't like that word because it has a bad connotation about it. So when God says to you, you need to understand the true force of the will, all you do is say, I understand what the true force of the will is. We were at a Bible study the other evening and someone said, the words just come out. They just come out. And everybody was saying, yeah. You know, my day's going fine and someone pushes my button and the words just come out. I don't know if you've experienced that, but who believes that? Who actually believes after seeing this, after understanding this, who can dare say words just come out? My hand just moves. That look just happens. There's no such thing as true conversion or untrue conversion. There's only conversion, conversion isn't or not conversion. Yeah, isn't that related to conversion then? You know, if you are converted, then yeah. you would have the desire to, to do. And how do you get converted? Um, when you confess your sins. Well, well sorry. Be conver it's um, really confess your experience. sins, be converted. I'm going to say this. You get converted when you read this thing and you believe it. Because what you're converted on now, is you're not converted about the rights and wrongs of shouting. Everybody knows that before they become a Christian. You don't have to be part of God's people to understand that shouting's wrong, or smacking is wrong, or swearing is wrong. Everybody knows that. <coughs> but you want to rebel. You want to say, I want to do it anyway. It's not that you don't understand, it's that you want to do it. God says, you shouldn't be doing that. And you say, I want to do it anyway. And that to me, sounds like the everlasting gospel. Because God says, I'm warning you, stop it. And you're saying, I feel like rebelling against you, God, because I'm going to shout at my child. I'm going to be rude. I'm going to take that thing, what isn't mine. If you've got that experience, what do you need to understand? The true force of the will. So you just get those words and you say, every time something bad happens to me, I just need to understand the true force of the will. And when you understand that, you are unassailable. As the brother just said here, you stop doing sin. It's really simple to understand. Is it difficult? Ask people who do exercise or weight training. The theory is easy. The practice is a bit more involved. You have to put some effort into it. We're not arguing that, but it's easy to understand. And what we need to do is get out of this rebellion, call it by its right name, and get onto the real platform of truth. And this is all related to the third angel's message. I want to read this thing that I found over the break. Christ triumphant, Christ triumphant, 81.2. That's CTR 81.2. There is hope for every one of us. Everybody here, there's hope for you to be saved. You can be saved, there's hope. But there's only one way. You can only be saved in one way. You have to look and believe and then stand upon that. Because if you look and believe and don't stand, what are you in? You're in rebellion. Don't call it by, don't call it by any other name. Call it for what it is. There is hope for every one of us, but only in one way. By fastening ourselves to Christ. So what does it mean to fasten yourself on Christ? Does that mean fasten yourself on some dream you had about him when you were just waking up this morning? 
that you thought he was speaking to you? What does it mean to fasten your... How do you even know who Christ is? It's only through the word. That's the only place you find Christ. Who knows how tall Christ was? Or his skin colour? Why don't you know? You should know. You should know. Why don't you know? Let's have a vote. Because it's not in the word. It's not in the word. Everything that you know about Christ that will bring you to salvation is all in the word. It's nowhere else. It's not some personal experience that you can have. Not some vision or some dream that you can have. It's all in the word. By fasting ourselves to these words and exerting every energy to attain to the perfection of his character. So let's give an example. You got home, you had a bad day, and your children have start irritating you. And you feel like attacking them. Do you have to attack them? Why are you attacking them? Because you're in rebellion against who? God. And you're not fasting yourself to him. So what you need to do is withdraw from your children while they're doing what their sin and leave them. Then you go and lock yourself in a closet and do what? Pray. You to get yourself and fasten yourself to Christ. Then come and deal with the problem. It's really simple. It's really, and this, this rule applies to everything and anything. So when your boss at work says, fiddle the numbers, and you say, it's not company policy, he says, don't worry, I am your manager. You're not answerable to the company, you're answerable to me. What do you do? You don't answer. You go to the do- toilet, the bathroom, you go to your closet and you lock yourself in there and you get straight with God. You fasten yourself to him and then you meet your manager and you face whatever consequences that is. But we don't do that. Over and over again, we're rebelling in our lives. I- I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying not to ad- answer questions. This is what it calls, it's, this is what she says, it's a really interesting phrase. By fasting ourselves to Christ and exerting every energy to attain to the perfection of his character, this goody-goody religion, this is what it says, this goody-goody religion that makes light of sin, how do we make light of sin? By calling rebellion by another name, like a mistake. It was a mistake. I'm human. I'm human. It just came out. It took me 10 minutes to explain to somebody that when you f- get your lips and you form into the sound of an O, it takes an awful lot amount of energy, time and effort to get from here to there for that to happen. And this person was trying to persuade me, it just happened. If you go to the book of Exodus and you see what Aaron says when Moses said, uh, how did that calf come about? What did he say? We, we threw in the gold and out came the car. He said, it just happened. It just happened. And we, and, and, and we can smile about that, but that's the sin that we're doing. We just say, it just happened. I couldn't help it. It was a mistake. God understands. Don't you know that Rahab lied and she was saved? We come up with all excuses to justify Rebellion. And this, this behaviour, she calls a goody-goody religion. This is why she says it's goody-goody religion. This goody-goody religion that makes light of sin and that is forever dwelling upon the love of God to the sinner. Encourages sinners to believe that God will save them while they continue in sin and know it to be sin. If you are living a life where you are continually doing sin and saying sorry at the end of the day, wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I don't want to be doing sin, but you did sin. This is called a goody-goody religion and it makes light of sin. And I'm contending, without knowing any of you, 
that most of you are in this condition. The most of you are in this condition. And the reason you're in this condition is because you don't understand the everlasting gospel. Because the third angel's message is not being preached and understood clearly and correctly. This is the way that many are doing who profess to believe present truth. So she's going to bring it right into present truth. Isn't a third angel's message present truth? Yeah. Yeah. And this is how most people who preach the third angel's message are behaving. They've got a goody-goody religion that makes light of sin because every time you sin, you say, well, it wasn't my fault. It was the children that you gave me. It's their fault. I was born that way. Now, if my parents hadn't done all these things to me when I was young, I wouldn't be like this today. Everybody is looking for excuses. And why do we do that? Because we want to lighten our sins. We want to have this goody-goody religion, even those who are on present truth. The truth is kept apart from their life, and that is the reason it has no more power to convict and convert the soul. There must be a straining of every nerve and spirit and muscle to leave the world, its customs, its practices, and its fashions. If you think you're going to leave the world and it's going to be easy, it's not. And I'm not, I, don't, I don't mean giving up cheese and going from a three meal plan to a two or not snacking. I mean some serious stuff. If you think you're going to easily get away from uh, city living into country living, it's going to happen really easily. If you think it's going to be easy separating from your former brethren, if you think you're not going to have a whole heap of trouble when you start stepping out on this truth and nobody else is standing up with you and you've got to bear responsibilities and burdens that you didn't dream of. Everybody that I know who came upon this message, who understands this present truth, the everlasting gospel, did it for one reason, for their own personal benefit, because they saw some light in it. And then, X weeks, months, years down the road, they find themselves in a position where they've now got responsibilities. I didn't get onto this message so I could come and travel 200 miles and spend my Sabbath day with, with you. I thought I could have a better walk with God, that I could have a clearer understanding of the last day event so I could make some preparation that I needed. You'll find the same. God's going to call you to, to bear responsibilities that you've got no idea of. You're going to drag your children to places they don't want to go to. You're going to cause trouble in your family. Because parents are here because they want to be. Children aren't, by and large. You have to come away from the world, its customs, its practices and its fashions. I want to read... a statement that you're all probably familiar with. And then we're going to backtrack. We're going to try and unpackage what this means. Some of our brethren... Oh, sorry, this is from... I'm going to, I'm going to read three articles. They're all Review and Herald. This one is... The middle one. It's April 1st. 1890. Look at the date. 1890. So you know it's in, in the time period of the latter rain being poured out. So this is in the time period of the latter rain being poured out. The other one we're going to read is March 25th, 1890. And the third one we're going to look at is August 19th, 1890. I'm going to read a bit from this one first. Has everybody heard this one? You should have, because I've read it before. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five were foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. Familiar with that one? Yes. Everybody who's on first present truth has read that before. I'm going to try and give 
the historical context of this passage. Okay? This was here, August 19th, 1890. So, Ellen White's writing this for a purpose. It's something to do with the latter rain. It's not just some kind of thing that's out there in the cloud. She's reading it for a reason. I'm going to read another statement from here now, this one here. It's another one you've heard. Some of our brethren have expressed fears that we, should dwell too, that we shall dwell too much upon the subject of justification by faith. But I hope and pray that none will needlessly be al- none will be needlessly alarmed. Um, let me just check if that's the one I want to read to you. Oh no, I'm going to read the next paragraph. I'm going to read the next paragraph. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. We heard that one before. So let's try and see what she's saying here. Several have written to me inquiring if if justification by faith. So we've got justification by faith. What, is, what do you understand justification by faith to mean? Believing that you're, believing that you're so so you, you're justified. So you're made right with God. How? Okay, through through faith. So just you're made right with God by faith. Okay, by belief. Not by works. Yeah? So that's a typical understanding of what justification by faith is. So we understand that, yeah? She says, several have written to me inquiring, if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. So someone's asking her and saying, is this experience here, is this the third angel's message? So we're going to say it equals the third angel's message. So that's the question, and this is what she says. I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. So what does verity mean? In truth, truth. yeah? So she, what's the answer? The answer is yes. So the answer is yes, justification by faith. You're made right with God by faith. Is the third angel's message. Does that, does that make sense? So, to be made right with God, let's pick out the word right. What's the opposite of right? Okay, so in the context of sinning or not sinning, this is sin and this is not sin. Yeah? So this is sin and not sin. So people say, you need to stop sinning. And how do you stop sinning, according to this? By faith. You just just do it by faith. What is faith? Okay, so faith is believing... Did you say with or without? Without. Without. What did I say a minute ago that how were you saved? What did I say how you saved a few minutes ago when I rubbed it out here? If you if you want to stop shouting at your children, understand what? How did you know all that statement? Where did that all that statement come from? And how did you know it was there? by you reading. If you're reading, what you're using? You're seeing. But we want to have a definition of faith that says it's believing without seeing. So you're going to be made right with God by doing something that you can't see. So you have to ask yourself, 
Well, which one are you going to go for? Are you going to go for this definition that says, you're going to stop sinning by not seeing, and I'm saying, you're going to stop sinning by what you see, because what you see is a thing that gives you the experience. It's the thing that gives you your experience. So when there are a number of people who are quoting that verse, when it says, believing in something that you can't see, what is it that you can't see? What is he talking about? You can't see the end. So on what basis do you believe? It says believe. Why are you believing in something that you can't see? On what basis are you? Someone says you've got evidence. What evidence have you got? Sorry? Because you can see the beginning. A whole concept that's built around this one phrase that talks about justification by faith is being made right with God just by believing without seeing is fallacious. Because the thing is, you need to see. And the thing that you can't see is the end. Tell me what's going to happen when the Sunday law happens. How do you know what's going to happen? Because you see, by the beginning, you know what's going to happen on the things you can't see because you know what you can see. Can we see how subtle it is to get these things wrong when we get Bible verses and we don't interpret them correctly? We see this and we put a Bible verse on it. Faith is believing without seeing, so you can't see God, so you just have to believe that he's there and you just believe he's there, and you're going to stop doing sin. And you know, does it work in your experience? It doesn't. Because you're not doing it correctly, you're not going to the Word and seeing what you're supposed to be seeing. And then when you see it, you, stop, you, you better be sure that you're not in rebellion to what you're seeing. You can't be in rebellion to what you can't see. To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, it is rebellion. D does that make sense? Yeah. It gets worse than that. So do we say in justification by faith is the third angel's message? Yeah. And we're going to turn this justification by faith, which is basically not doing any sin, not doing any sin is the third angel's message. And I'm contending that that is not correct. What you are doing is renting the third angel's message, manipulating it and turning it into something that God did not intend it to be, which is an experience only. Because the third angel's message is not the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel is a one, two, three-step testing process. It's not just some experience. And what we do is we take out these phrases and we use them to justify our rebellion instead of reading them in the context that they were given. So you go to compilations, you go to convocation days and people quote this statement over and over again and they don't put it in its context in the, in the setting of the article itself and then don't set the article in the context of a historical event that's going on. Because this event that's going on in 1890 is when the latter rain is being poured out upon God's people, is it not? Isn't that what happens in 1888? So to take this statement and say, this is what justification by faith is, it's the third angel's message in verity, and not explain it in the context of this event, people will become confused about what's happening. So what we want to do is, we want to go through these articles, I'm not going to read them all because they're quite lengthy, and we're going to try and place this statement and try and make an understanding of it. The reason why I say that is this, the reason why I'm, I'm even looking at it is because in conservative Adventism, not liberal Adventism, because liberal Adventism doesn't care if you sin or not, They've just got a totally different theology. They've got the goody-goody uh, theology. 
But conservatives say, no, we don't. We're going to put away sin. And when you start talking about the third angel's message, and you start delineating it, do you understand what delineation means? Putting it upon a line with events. They're saying that is not the third angel's message. The third angel's message is an experience that you need to put away sin, and then Jesus will come. And even though it sounds like a subtle argument, the implications, the ramifications are deadly serious. Because what you're doing is, you're doing what the people doing, the church was doing in this history, they were rejecting the message of God. Before I go back to this statement, I'm going to read the paragraph, that's I'm going to read the same paragraph that's attached to this, the same paragraph. Before we do that, let's go to Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. Revelation 18, verse 1. Some people, even during the break, sometimes have concerns that I'm going too slowly or I'm not putting things in detail. And what I want to try to explain is, if we don't have these principles and these concepts well understood in our minds, drawing out complex lines sometimes becomes a futile exercise because we don't understand the ramifications of what those, ish, what those lines are trying to teach us because we don't want to just understand events for the sake of them. We want to bring those events into our personal experience. We want to bring those events into our personal experience. So, for instance, if you want to understand how you should be behaving every Sabbath day, who you should be listening to, where you should be fellowshipping. How would you know what to do? Based upon what we've spoken about, how do you know what to do? Where would you look? You'd look in the scripture. But you have to look in the scripture in a specific certain way, in a three-step process, and understand those histories clearly, and you go back and you see what those events are teaching you. And those events will guide you. That's what faith really is. That's what faith really is. Faith isn't saying, oh, I hope, cross my fingers, that Ellen White's right in great controversy, there's going to be a Sunday law, because he doesn't say it in the scriptures. And, and, and we smile, but that's what most God's people are doing. But just in case, we better get educated and get a good job, because we might be here a long time. <laughs> just in case. We have this just-in-case kind of a theology, a way of thinking, because we don't really believe. Why don't we believe? It's not because we're bad people, because we're coming out of darkness, because we don't understand how to believe. We don't even understand what to believe, because we read the book of Daniel and Zedekiah and Jehoiachin and Jehoiakim, we think, what's that got to do with us? What's that got to do with us? Ellen White says, the church looks like it's going to fall, but it doesn't. And I'm saying, you don't understand what that passage means if you think it means this structure is going through. Because it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that at all. And you only can understand that if you go back in history carefully. In the context of this passage here, we'll read the sentence. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. So let's read Revelation 18, verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Let me ask you a question. What is that earth? What is, not, what is, the, what is the earth not? What is it not? Earth. It's not the planet earth. It's not the planet earth. So if you think, I haven't seen much glory around in the newspapers or anything going on, whether they're church or secular, I can't see millions of people getting excited about something. I can't see some great glory going on because you're, getting, you're mixing literal with symbolic. This earth 
is not the physical earth. Whatever it is, you have to believe that, that it's not the earth. We just read that. Let's go back to this statement. And I have answered, is the third angel's message in verity. The prophet declares. So if I said the prophet declares, where would you go looking in the scriptures? Because she's telling you a prophet has declared this. So now she's going to paraphrase something. She's going to paraphrase something. And let's see what she says. And after these things, did we just read that? Yeah. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. I'm going to just stop here. When we read Spirit of Prophecy, we have come into a delusionary experience that we think we could just read these words as some kind of devotion. And we don't read it correctly. So ask yourself the question. She's talking about this. Justification by faith in verity. You're made right with God. You stop sinning by believing. You just stop sinning by believing. And then she says, oh yeah, that's what the third angel's message is. Then in the next sentence, she's quoting Revelation. Why would she be quoting Revelation 18 verse 1 in reference to this statement? Because she wants to tie it in. Even if you don't understand what she wants to tie in, because we're starting from position because we don't know, you have to see that she's trying to tie it in. But I can't remember, I can't say never, but I can't remember anyone who's ever quoted this and tied it into Revelation 18 verse 1. They just say, justification by faith is an experience with God, and that means you need to eat right, dress right, be country living, and you're going to be saved. And once you've got all that packed down, you're ready to go to heaven. That's what people do to the third angel's message. That you need to have some spiritual experience with God. You need to get yourself in order, stop you in your sin. That's what the third angel is. And, and then Jesus is going to come and you're going to be on the right side of the argument. I'm contending that that is the behaviour of a Pharisee. If you go back to the Pharisees and you see where in their physical life they were doing anything wrong, you can't point it out. They're tithing. They're eating, they're dressing, they're doing everything right. When you think this is the third angel's message without putting it in relation to what's going on around you, it's called salvation by works. And it is so subtle, most of God's people are confused about this issue. And it's because, in the context of all of this, they're not getting a third angel's message and understanding it along the lines that have been given by William Miller. It all comes down to the same point over and over again. We don't understand what the everlasting gospel is. We're wrenching, wrenching out number three from one and two. We're trying to turn it to an experience and not understanding that it's an event that's going on. All of these things have to be thought about carefully. You have to tax your energies. There might be some of you, because uh, I can sort of see your face in expense, sometimes you think, what's he talking about? This looks difficult, this is confusing. I don't understand. This is going to tax your mind. This is not a goody, goody religion. This hurts your brain. I don't know if anybody here is doing a degree or has done a degree, but you didn't get that for free. It took time, energy and effort and we think Christianity is for free. And we forget that the parable that says you have to sell everything. You have to sell your house, your car, your children, your clothes, everything you've got to buy Christ. Everything has to be sold. It's not a free religion. It's the most expensive religion there is. It costs you everything. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. Brightness, glory, and power are to be connected with the third angel's message, and conviction will follow wherever it is preached in demonstration of the Spirit. How will any of our brethren know when this light shall come to God's people? So that's a good question. When the third angel, when, so not the third, when this angel comes down, how are you going to know? How are you going to, through prophecy, through past prophecy, you're going to start connecting things. You're not going to know by looking. Do you think you're going to read it in a messenger? Oh, the, Revelation 18. 
we laugh. The reason why I mention that is, I think it was two, maybe three years ago, on the front cover of the messenger, I don't know if you remember what it said. It said, if you're at church and there's this brother talk, start talking to you about the fourth angel and come to some secret clandestine meetings about the fourth angel, it said, run from them. This is the fourth angel that was being referred to in that messenger article. And God's leadership are telling you that when someone says, the question she asks is, how will any of our brethren know when this light shall come to these people? When someone comes to your church, a stranger, and sits next to you and says, you can come to my house and I can give you a meeting when this, and I'm going to tell you when this angel comes down. You've been instructed by the leadership to run from him. So how are you ever going to know? Each of us are in this dilemma. How do you know? How do you know what I'm saying is true? We read it earlier. How do you know what I'm saying is true? How do you know this theory is real? Because you line up scripture with scripture and then you know you cannot be in error. You cannot be in error. No matter what anybody says. So, this is a real question because this is being asked in 1890, two years after the Minneapolis conference, and they're still struggling. They're saying, the angel hasn't arrived yet. The leadership have rejected Jones and Wagner, and they're saying, they haven't come yet. The angel isn't down here yet. And she's saying, well, how will any of our brethren know that this light has come to God's people? How are they supposed to know? How were the God's people supposed to know that the angel had come down? Because God raised up two men to tell them. They said, it's arrived. And they said, this isn't what we were expecting. We weren't expecting this. We weren't expecting the shepherds or some... Islamic people from the east to give the message of Christ's arrival it should have come through the leadership so it can't be correct history is being repeated over and over again how shall any of our brethren know when this light shall come to God's people as yet we certainly have not seen the light that answers to this description God has people sorry God has light for his people and all who will accept it will see the sinfulness of remaining in a lukewarm condition and they will heed the counsel of the true witness and then she quotes uh, Revelation 3 the only point I'm trying to draw out just from this paragraph is there are many people who are quoting this part of this they, they take it out of its context and say the third angel's message is this you need to go home Shut the door and get your life in order and that's what the third angel is. And stop doing your sin. And the, reason you get, the way you're going to do that is by having faith in something that you can't see. And I'm saying, my theory is that that is wrong. And you have to understand for yourselves, is my theory demonstrated line upon line, here a little, there a little, that it becomes an abiding truth that has no error in it. You have to make that decision because the vast majority of conservative Adventism, which most of us fit into, say that that's, that's what justification by faith is. It's the third angel's message and the third angel's message isn't. And this whole context of all of this is all centered around the third angel sorry, the fourth angel when it comes down. And when, what does this fourth angel do to the third angel? We've discussed this before. It gives power. It gives power. So this experience that you have that, that's being spoken of, because she says it, it really happens, it's the third angel's mission in verity. How can you say to somebody, you need to have this experience and detach it Detach it from Revelation 18. Because people say, I don't believe Revelation 18, verses 1 and 2 happened. 
And 9-11, Revelation 18, verse 1, was fulfilled. It was fulfilled. And the vast majority of Adventism, if you ex even if you exclude all liberal Adventism, the vast majority of conservative Adventism say no. But we believe this. They believe this, but they don't read the next sentence and see that it's connected to this very thing. This is the subtle deception that Satan has placed upon God's people. The context of this, of this article is this. Repentance. That's the context of this whole, pass of this whole article. Repentance. Where do you find repentance? First Angel's message right here. And she says, the culmination, the final fulfillment of perfect repentance happens when you have an awareness, a mental belief, that Revelation 18, verse 1, has come down and has been fulfilled. And the vast majority of people who war against this message say, that is not true. All you need to do is have an experience with God and that is a third angel's message. And it's not. It's not. The third angel's message is not just having this experience with God in some kind of nebulous way. It happens at the end of the world right here. And if you don't believe this, you can't experience this. If you don't believe this, you can't experience this. And it's even worse than that, because what this does to you is this. It limits sin. It limits what your definition of sin is. If I said, well, you know, tell me what, what sin is, you'd say, uh, I don't know. No pork. Um, miniskirt. You know, any kind of reform that you want to label there. Hundreds of things you could, you, could, you could label there, yeah? This is what we limit your personal experiential sin to be. But there's much more than that. There's much more than that. And if you don't see this statement in relation to the everlasting gospel, which is a three-step testing process, which is these satanic darkness that's been uh, foisted upon God's people, you won't overcome sin like you're required to. If you all go, we're not going to turn there, but if you go to Ezekiel, and Ezekiel is told to go to the temple, and he's shown what is happening in Israel, and he's shown these three, sorry, it's not three, these four steps, these progressive four steps, and where does it end in? It ends at the worship in the sun. So we know that that worship in the sun Who's worshipping the sun in, that, in the context of that discussion? The leaders. God's people. This is not the world. God's people are worshipping the sun. The sun god. Sunday. They're worshipping them. So what have the other three things got to do with? What are those other three things got to do with? Those other three things, there's the jealousy, or the image of jealousy, I should say. Do you remember what the other ones are? And uh, Tammuz, isn't it? Weeping for Tammuz. Is that the right order? Yeah. So, what we want to understand is, is that these sins of our fathers are all going to come back to us. And we need to deal with these sins. We need to deal with these sins. Who knows what an image is? It's, it's, it's a representation. I don't think everybody thinks of it as, as something negative. But an image isn't something negative. It's just something. 
Okay, so if I were if I were to draw this, is that an image? No. The Ten Commandments. Yeah. It's a representation of what? Of God. It's a representation of God. And in Exodus 20, and in the last part of uh, when you go uh, back into 19, what's the definition of God? What does he say what kind of God he is? He says, I'm a jealous God. And this is the image. You've got the image of jealousy, which is the Ten Commandments. So what sin are God's people doing? Because they've got an image of jealousy. So they're creating their own image. They're creating their own image. So you need to go back into Adventist history and see where do we come up with our own inventions? Where we're going to place our faith upon, where we're going to walk away from this image and create our own image. So we know that there was an 1843 chart and an 1850 chart. There was an 1843 and 1850 chart. I'll try and pull out the passage, but you know what Ellen White calls this? She calls this the Rock of Ages. And who's the Rock of Ages? Christ. So how can she say these documents are Christ? <coughs> Let me ask you a question. If, if you understand where I'm going, is all of this, these two stones, is this all God? Is it all God? No. no. Someone's saying, no, why is it not all God? Why not? Okay, I'm gonna, I guess, uh, yeah. But let, let, let me ask a different question then. This stone is that, and, it, and it's got that on it. What is this? This is God. And what is this stone? Moses. This is not all God. This is a combination of Moses' work and God's work. The words are God's, but whose are the tables? Who made those tables? Moses did. Did he make them perfectly? No. no. Same with these stones, uh, sorry, these charts. These have a representation of God. She calls them the Rock of Ages, but who made them? Men. These are a combination of the work of man and a combination of the work of God. And she says these are like God. These are the image of God. They're a representation of God. This is the image of jealousy, and this is an image of jealousy. And who gave us those images? God did. So these are the true images of jealousy. And God's people have made a substitute. They made their own. So in 1863, they made their own image of jealousy. Why? Why would they do that for? Because they're rebelling against God. They're saying, we don't want your image, we want to create an image in our own likeness, in our own understanding. So, when we talk about justification by faith is being made right with God by faith in connection with the third angel's message, in the time period where Revelation 18 verse 1 is coming down, we don't need to just deal with our own little sins. There's a whole heap more sins that we're committing. Like we're in rebellion to God. And God wants us to come out of that rebellion. And part of that rebellion is, who gave you authority to make this chart? No one did. If no one gave you authority to make this chart, why are you even believing what's on there? And why are you warring against this image with this image? Can you see the whole issue about putting away sin? Justification by faith is a whole lot more than what you eat, drink or wear. There's, there's more in this, much, much more than we realise at face value. Do you know why most of us think in the way that we do? Education. Education, Education the way we do it, is studying whose word? Man's, Man's word above Man's. God's word. When Eve was speaking to the serpent, what was she doing? Placing... His words above God's. 
That's the definition of spiritualism or witchcraft. If you go and see what the inspired definition of a secret chamber is, that's what it is. It's spiritualism. We've, this church is steeped in spiritualism. Steeped in it. That's why when we come to the end of the world, we don't know our left hand from our right hand. We don't even understand what, what truth is. We don't even understand how to, uh, how to read scripture. Because all of this truth has been buried by spiritualism. But we don't want to call it spiritualism. Ellen White calls it books of a new order. She calls it books of a new order. And each of one, one of us has been trained in those ways. We've been trained in those ways without even realising it. And we have to repent of all of that. So when I say to you, does it say you need to understand the true force of the will? We say, yeah, because that's what's written. I'm saying, well, don't turn around tonight and say, oh, I sinned by mistake. It wasn't my fault. Because you are now exhibiting the sins that your father did right here because you've just changed the gospel into a sin, repent, sin, repent gospel. Because that's what everyone else believes. But it's not scripturally based. Weeping of Tammuz. How many times have you heard, we're going to pray for the latter rain at 777? And all the permutations of that. It's all a false latter rain. It's all foolishness. Weeping for Tammuz. These are the sins that we need to repent of. When you see advertise, you should ring everybody that you know and explain to them what it is for what it is. That this is sin to go on your knees at 777 because you've entered into this foolishness which is the sins that, that your fathers did. You're weeping, you're asking for a latter rain that is false. And we don't understand the seriousness of it, the sinfulness of sin. We think, get these sort and that, you're on your way to heaven. Because we don't read things in their context and understand the seriousness of what the everlasting gospel is. And people go to war on this issue. People go to war. There is, I, I know it's starting maybe to get confused because I'm adding so many different elements to it. We've spoken about literal and spiritual. We've talked, spoken about line upon line and people professing they believe it if they've got a crowd behind them on a good day. But when they're standing against a church board, they're not going to stand up with line upon line. They'll back down. They back down because they don't really believe it. They won't stand upon the word. But everybody in that here says, oh, when the Sunday law comes, we're going to stand. None of us will stand when the Sunday law comes because we've forgotten what the everlasting gospel is because of these steps that Satan has gradually led his people into, this progressive destruction. And it happened in four stages. And we're in the fourth stage now. The Sunday law is just about to happen. And the leadership from up all the way down have already started facing the sun. Just about to bow down. And we think we're not going to bow down with them. There were only three men that didn't bow that day. Only three. And then the fourth joined them, a three-one combination. And there were thousands of Jews in that crowd. And none of them thought they would. But the reason you do it is because you think God can't kill 14 million people, 16 million people. He wouldn't do that, would he? So you think there's safety in numbers. If there's enough of us believe something, we can hold God to ransom. But the Pharisees were better than us because they said he'll kill these miserable men and give his vineyard to other people. We won't even, we, we're so bad we won't even admit that. We won't even admit that God can actually get rid of us and get some new people. We say he can't do that, it's not going to happen.
I want to read some statements from this one, from March. There's a, these theories are connected together. They're connected. They're connected because they're related to the third angel's message, being empowered by Revelation 18, verse 1. As we're on it, Revelation 18, verse 1, when it came down in 1888, does everybody understand that and believe that and see it? In 1888, the third angel's message began to be empowered through the light of Revelation 18. We just read that a minute ago. Why wasn't that the end of the story? Why didn't it all come to its complete fruition? Why, why did it stall? So a different answer. Someone says, who, who didn't believe? Who didn't believe? Someone said they didn't believe. Who didn't believe? The leaders. Okay, so we're going to go, let's go with this one. Let's think about this. We're saying, in 1888, the reason why God didn't finish the work then is because the leadership didn't believe. Yeah? So today, that means God's not going to finish the work now because how many of the leadership do you know that believe? None. None. So you know, if you believe that we're in the last days, that the reason it, it wasn't yet fulfilled in 1888 wasn't because of the leadership. The leadership never were going to believe. So that wasn't the reason. Someone else gave some answers. Ready. There aren't 144,000 at the moment. Yeah. There's never 144,000 at the beginning. Is the, is the, church, the leadership plus the church, and the church follows the leadership. And, and they... I'm not going to demonstrate it today, but as we go along, we'll be able to see clearly, I believe, the reason is, is because of Wagner and Jones. They're the ones that were at fault. So if you understand who Wagner and Jones is today, it's you sitting in this room. Giving this message to people, to their friends and relatives, going to church and saying, you need to get your house in order. Jones and Wagner didn't really, they gave a message but they didn't put, we read a minute ago, you need to put your whole life in order in relationship to this message. They didn't. And how many warnings did they get? Time and time again, they're being warned to, to get themselves straightened out. We're so apt to believe the reason why it didn't happen is because the church didn't believe, or the leadership, but the church doesn't believe now. I don't know how, what your membership here is in this city, but how many, what percentage of the membership here believe this message? 1%? Half a percent? So you're in the same situation. That's not the reason why. It's because Jones and Wagner didn't go through this experience because they didn't deal with the sins that were relating to them. Not just these ones, they didn't deal with these ones. Let's read some of this statement here. March 25. March 25, 1890. We need our eyes anointed. When did you get anointed? 9-11, for those who understand. Christ was baptised in AD 27 at his baptism, and he was the anointed one. And we can mark that anointing of him with God's people being anointed at 9-11. We must not think, well, we have all the truth. We understand the main pillars of our faith and we may rest on this knowledge. The truth is advanced in truth and we must walk in the increasing light. Can you see what they were doing from 18... We marked 1884, uh, but it, it also goes from 1881. They'd rejected and when the advancing light's come in, when the fourth angel has come down from Revelation 18... The advancing light. What are they saying? We don't need that. They resist that light. The truth is an advancing truth. We must walk in increasing light. A brother asked, Sister White, do you think we must understand the truth for ourselves? Why can we not take the truths that others have gathered together and believe them because they've investigated the subjects 
And then we shall be free to go on without the taxing of the powers of the mind in the investigation of all these subjects. Her obvious answer is going to be no. Why can't it work that way? Why can't you just take my word for it? Because I've done loads of study on it, or Brother Romain, he studied. Why can't you just believe what we're saying and just say, well, they said it was right. Watch the DVD. Go on YouTube and you see it, and you know, when you speak to somebody. Why can't we do that? Because if you do that... So I was going to say, it's just like when the um, Ted Virgin is trying to take the oil from them, you need the individual experience. Because if you do that, you're not meeting God through his word. You need to meet God through his word personally. If you don't make commitment, if you don't cut down your hours at work, if you don't stop doing all the things that the cares of the world are demanding of you and make time to study to see if those things are so, as the Bereans did, you will not develop the experience. You will not be able to get out of the situation that you find yourself in and escape from the wrath to come. It has to be an abiding experience. And the only way you get that is by studying for yourself and not taking the word of another man. It is dangerous for us to make flesh our arm. We should lean upon the arm of infinite power. God has revealing this to us for years. We, have, we must have living faith in our hearts and reach out for larger knowledge and more advanced light. She's talking about a time period when Revelation 18 has come down, the time period in which we're living. So these relate to us. Brethren, we must sink the shaft deep into the mind of truth. You may question matters with yourselves, with one another, if you only do it in the right spirit. But too often, self is large, and as soon as the investigation begins, an unchristian spirit is manifested. She's talking about the experience that they're having now. These men are standing up and saying, you've got the everlasting gospel wrong. We're, we've got it right, and we're going to instruct you how it works. And all these men say, who do you think you are to teach us? And they rise up, and instead of having a, a Christian discussion about what these truths are, an unchristlike spirit is developed and you get into a warfare because people do not want to hear what the truth is. They don't want to hear from people. This is just what Satan delights in, but we should come with a humble heart to know for ourselves what is truth. In that statement, who is she blaming? Jones and Wagner or the people who are listening to the message? The people. In the context of our dynamics, she's not blaming me, She's blaming you. She's not saying, oh, Perminda, you were a bit unchrist like the way you said that. You know, you, you, you should be more forgiving, more gentle. Don't be so harsh. She's saying the problem is with the people who are receiving the information, they are rising up. We must be able to present the precious truth at the right time. When's the right time? Revelation 18, verse 1, 9, 11. It has to be at a certain time. We do not claim that in the doctrine sought out by those who have studied the word of truth, there may not be some error, for man that lives is for no man lives that is infallible. But God has light has sent light. We want it, and God has sent light, and let every man be careful how he treats it. Another argument that comes up is you guys aren't even perfect, and you make these mistakes. You can go back into all histories and see where people have made mistakes. Did John the Baptist have a misconception of the work of the Messiah? Did it affect the truthfulness or the force of his message? No. Did he give it any error in his message? No. But people use this as a thrust not to listen to what's been presented because something that was taught two years ago may not be quite right today and people use that as an argument to say, see, you don't even know the message yourself. She's addressing this issue. As the truth is proclaimed, men will say, be careful now. Don't be too zealous, too positive. You want the truth. Of course we want the truth. And we want it just as it is in Jesus. Our brethren should be willing to investigate in a candid way 
every point of controversy. If a brother is teaching error, those who are in responsible positions ought to know it. And if he is teaching truth, they ought to take their stand on his side. Ten minutes. We should all know what is being taught among us. For if it is truth, we need to know it. So, do people know what is being taught in this room? No. Why? They've not checked. Are they required to? The people in responsible positions are required to know what's going on. The conference are required to know what's going on in this city. And what are they doing? Rub washing their hands of it and say it's nothing to do with us. It's some cult group over there who are doing something. And they're repeating the history. And not only that, they're saying to everyone else, you don't go and find out what's happening either. And that's the exact repeat of history when Christ was born. Herod forces the priest to explain where the Messiah is about to be born. And they force that command to do that. They say Nazareth. And then what did they do afterwards? They let it known to everybody, first of all, that they're not going to go and investigate it. And they tell everybody it's some fanatical delusion. Don't listen to any of it. So they don't know what's going on. The same thing is happening now. They're required to know. Your friends are required to know what is being taught here. And they're required to come and listen to it. And if it's error, to show clearly in front of everybody where the error is. We should all know what is being taught amongst us. For if it's truth, we need to know it. The Sabbath school teacher needs to know it. And every Sabbath school scholar ought to understand it. We are all under obligation to know, to God, to know what he sends to us. He has given directions by which we may test every doctrine, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. I'm, I'm suggesting this. When someone stands up and says the everlasting gospel, the third angel's message, is justification by faith, and that's what it is in verity, then they're not going to the law and to the testimony. And it's not according to the word to make such statements. Because they're saying, you're going to be okay without seeing. And the testimony of inspiration says, that is not the way the gospel works. The way the gospel works is by seeing what happened before, then you understand what's going to happen. And without that clear distinction between these two things, people are not going to the law and test testimony to prove if they're speaking to that word. But if it is according to this test, do not be so full of prejudice that you cannot acknowledge your point when it is proof to you simply because it does not agree with your ideas. Remember I spoke about this discussion I had about the four winds, Revelation 7. He's got a problem with Revelation 7, this person has. I'm talking to Ezekiel. And the penny starts to drop. And then I say, do you believe in line upon line here? And they don't reply. And it's this very thing that's being fulfilled. But if it's according to this test, do not be so full of prejudice that you cannot acknowledge your point when it is proof to you. Simply because you don't agree. It doesn't agree with your ideas. If this doesn't agree with your ideas, don't be so prejudiced to shut your ears. Listen until you can prove where it's wrong. Because I'm proving that this watered-down message, this goody-goody religion, is wrong. I've identified why it's wrong, how it's wrong, compared to what is right. Because that's what we're required to do. Do not catch at every objection, however small, and make it as large as possible. That's another technique that people do. They look at certain points, and they start picking at those points, and saying, if you can't answer that point, I'm not going to believe any of it. Don't catch at objections, even if they're small, and make it as large as possible, and preserve it for future use. No one has said that we shall find perfection in any man's investigations. But this I do know, that our churches are dying for the want of teaching on the subject of righteousness by faith in Christ, and for kindred truths. No matter by whom light is sent, we should open our hearts to receive it in the meekness of Christ. But many do not do this. When a controverted point is presented, they pour in question 
after question without acknowledging, without admitting the point when it is well sustained. Oh, may we act as men who want light. May God give us the spirit day by day and let the light of his countenance shine upon us that we may be learners in the school of Christ. I don't know how many discussions you have had with people, but this point happens over and over again. When a controverted point is presented, they pour question after question without acknowledging, without admitting a point when it is well sustained. So when you say... God came down and he overturned the buildings at 9-11 in the city of New York, a well-sustained point, people pouring question after question, like, it wasn't even Islam, it was someone else. And they look for objections, even when the point is well-sustained. They want to find holes in it. They don't want to believe that the third angel's message has to be connected to historical events which are delineated on the line because they're prophetic waymarks. And only when those waymarks come into history can these things be understood, can things come to a fulfilment. People don't want to believe that, so they make objection after objection to the place where people in responsible positions say, we're not even going to come and listen to what these people are saying. And yet, we're going to boldly say that they're wrong. If you've been to any board meetings or anything, you know that that's the technique that most people use who object to what's being discussed and what's being spoken. They have the attitude that if anyone, if any new truth comes, it has to come via them. It couldn't come any other way. It has to come through them and not any other way when new truth comes. My contention is, can you show that in scripture anywhere? No. You show the, it's always the opposite. It's always the opposite. We'll read some statements from here before we close, um, before lunch. When the third angel's message is preached as it should be. How is the third angel's message supposed to be preached as it should be? I'm saying this. Let me erase all, all of this because it's got very busy. Whoops. I'm saying this where we had justification by faith equals the third angel's message when the third angel's message is preached as it should be I'm saying this is not the way to preach the third angel's message and this is what 90% of conservative Adventism teaches the third message, the third message as that this is what it is and it's the wrong way to teach it. When the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends it. Power attends it. So power attends its proclamation, and it becomes an abiding influence. What does the word abiding mean? Fastening. Yeah, it doesn't just mean with. It means, it has this connotation of being in. When you abide in Christ, you're in him and he's in you. This is what happens in the parable of the ten virgins. When they wake up, five of them go to Christ and five of them separate from him. It will become an abiding experience. And when you've got an abiding experience with Christ, what happens about sin in your life? It's gone. And how does that happen? By believing what the word says and reading it for what it is. When it says a tree in Revelation, you don't turn that into a tree. You go and strain every nerve and Bible that you've got in your body and try and understand what a tree represents and then apply it correctly. You don't look around and wait for everybody else to say if they all believe line on line, I'll believe line upon line. You go and check in the scriptures and if you're the only person in your circle of friends that understands that the four winds are Islam, when you can show that line upon line, you stand upon that. You don't wait for other people to catch up. You don't keep silent because no one else is speaking. If you know that the image of jealousy that this church created in 1863 in rebellion to his message has connection with the 2520 and that is uh, uh, the first test 
that, that, is, that marks this four-step four degradation in, in, God's, in the experience of God's people. You know you're required to speak about it. You're required to speak about it. There are so many elements that we need to understand in a clear way when it becomes a Biden experience. It must be attended with divine power or it comes to nothing. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins. Five of them are wise, five of foolish. This parable has been, it was fulfilled in this history here from 1798 to 1844 and specifically from 1840 to 1844 and it, she says it will be and will be fulfilled to the very letter. For it has a spe special application to this time, the time of the end. And like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continue to be present true till the close of time. 1989, 9-11 to the Sunday law. It has been fulfilled and it will be fulfilled to the very letter. And she connects the parable to the third angel's message. And the third angel's message gets empowered right here as the first angel was empowered right here. And if you don't see it in connection to all of these issues that are being brought out in the context of the 1888 message, you won't know how to make an application in your own life. And you'll become, com com you'll become confused on what the third angel is and you'll turn it into some experience that you can work out all by yourself by reading some devotional books and not studying the events that are happening all around you and seeing that prophecy is being fulfilled. Because the prophecy that's being fulfilled all around you is required to shape your experience. And part of that is that you need to turn your forehead into a diamond because you're going to be banging it against people's heads who are made of stone. And you need to understand that you're going to be speaking to people who aren't going to listen to you. And you can't say, well, they don't listen. They're horrible people. I'll go and speak to someone else. You're required to speak to them. You're required to give the words. Do we know what the words are that we're required to give? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter, I think it's the back end of chapter 2. Last verse of paragraph chapter 2, 2.10. This is the words that you're supposed to speak. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there were write, written therein, lamentations and mourning and woe. Threefold message that we've got to give to the church, and none of them sound positive. Lamentations and mourning and woe. This is the message that you need to give to people. It doesn't sound like John 3.16, but neither does Revelation 14 or Revelation 18. Neither does the message of John the Baptist when he says you're a generation of vipers. When Jesus says, fill ye therefore the measure of your fathers. This is the message that God needs to give to his people to waken them up in their latest seeing condition. We'll just finish this paragraph, then we'll close. In the parable of the ten virgins, sorry, in the parable, the ten virgins had lamps, but only five of them had the saving oil with which to keep their lamps burning. So they've all got lamps. What are the lamps representing? The word, the word of God. Everybody's got the Bible. Remember we spoke about this last week, uh, last time I came. Everybody's got the Bible, but they're all saying it differently. Five have got oil and five don't. What is the oil? Okay. So the oil is specifically the messages that God has given to his people and he's pouring them out through his Holy Spirit. It's these messages that we're speaking. Five had the message and five don't, but they've all got their Bibles. Those who don't have the message, when the midnight cry happens, they're going to walk away from Christ. They will walk away from Christ. We will walk away from Christ if we are not receiving these messages. The latter rain is a message. It is not an experience that you will pray for at 777 and expect to receive it. You're supposed to pray for the latter rain in the time of the latter rain and ask any pastor when the latter rain is. And they'll tell you 
they don't know. Then ask them, why are you asking us to pray in a time period where you don't even know we're living in? It's foolish, foolishness is too slight a word. I don't, know, I don't know if it's sinful, it's too strong a word. But it's error. This represents the condition of the church. The wise and foolish have their Bibles and are provided with the means of grace, but many do not appreciate the fact that they must have the heavenly unction. What is an unction? It's like a command. They have to have the heavenly command. They do not heed the invitation. Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden in all the works and reforms that you're doing, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We'll close our presentation and continue it after lunch. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and your goodness towards us. Father, we know that some of the things that we have been talking about and discussing may be complex. There are many lines and thoughts, Father, that need to be laid one on top of the other. But amidst all the wheels within wheels that we are beginning to see, help us to have clarity, Father, in what the issue is. Whether or not we will be saved in the appointed way that you have given to your people. There are so many winds of doctrine in this church and out of this church. So many people have different understandings of how to be saved. But there is only one way. The way that you have told us, Father, is very clear in these last days. We're required to eat the little book. And when we eat that book, Father, we're required to repeat the words that the book has written in it and on it. Help us, Father, to do this work so that we might fulfill the prophecy and become part of that living fulfillment. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.